My name's Sharon Halpern, and I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in July 2000. It took many months for me to get the diagnosis, and uh, right after the diagnosis, I, I basically was in surgery, I think, uh, three days later. And, um, and there my story starts. It's a long, complicated story after 17 years. Um, I've had many, many uh, recurrences. I've had many surgeries, um, many rounds of chemo, and I feel well. And I thank God for, for that and for being able to live all this time well with ovarian cancer. When I first got diagnosed, um, after the, it was actually after the initial shock and after my initial treatment that I got on the computer and I started reading about the grim statistics of ovarian cancer. And that's when I got more frightened. I was so frightened. So um, I was looking for some support. And one of the things Ovarian Cancer Canada gave me at the time was a pamphlet. And in that pamphlet, there was a story about a woman with ovarian cancer, who I think at the time was about six years from the time that she had been diagnosed. And I read this story, and this woman is still a friend of mine. <laughs> and I read this story and I, it gave me hope. It was sort of like, oh my gosh, this is a, a person with ovarian cancer that is talking to me. And I've told her this, um, that I actually took a pamphlet and I put it under my pillow. I slept with it because that's how important it was to me. And I started to look for survival stories after that. And I found a number of them. And I thought, wait a minute, this might not be a, the death sentence that I had expected. So I realized the importance of being with other women that have ovarian cancer, listening to their stories, listening to what happened to them, all the different treatments they have had. And maybe that could help me. So I became part of a support group. And I know that when new people come into the group and they hear my story, and not that I've just survived 17 years, but I've survived through many surgeries, many chemos, many radiations. And they look at me and they go, no way. I, yes, it's true. It, you know, so I know that gives them hope. And it, not everybody is as lucky and will be as lucky as I am, but some will be. And even if they're not, I know just being with women that have ovarian cancer and know what they're going through, you're listening to the person beside you and you're thinking, yeah, she knows exactly what I'm feeling. It's not just another person saying, oh, I know what you're going through. This person does know, they really do know, and that's important. The information I share is information such as um, try to enjoy your life as much as possible. Yes, you're going to be frightened. Yes, you're going to be shocked. But you can't live a life being depressed all the time, being anxious all the time. Because if you do, it's no life. Then it's got you right from the beginning. It's got you. So you have to try and overcome that as much as you can and live the best life possible in between in between chemos, in between treatments, all of that kind of thing. The other thing I share is ask questions. Ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid anything. If you're nervous, if you're, something's worrying you, go to the doctor, go to the emergency, ask lots of questions. Don't, don't feel like you're bothering somebody, that you're a bother. Tell people. And also, you know, have some private time to grieve yourself. Um, there are times where I just need to be alone. I need to grieve what's happening to me. Not so much anymore, but I did in the past. So allow yourself that time. Allow yourself the time to be upset over what's happening to you because it is very upsetting. I had never heard about the BRCA gene. Even right after my diagnosis, I never thought about the BRCA gene. I never ever expected that I would have a hereditary cancer because my family did not talk about cancer. We had immigrated from England, so most of the family was still in England. And uh, the immediate family is just nothing, something they didn't talk about at all. Um, about th 
three years after my diagnosis, my doctor said to me, well, because you are Ashkenazi Jewish, maybe we should look to see, um, give you the blood test to see if you have the genetic uh, mutation. I, I said, no, there's no way I don't have that. Oh, but let's just check it out anyway. We happen to have a genetic clinic here at the hospital that just got started. Would you mind doing, it's just a blood test. I said, no, no, fine, I'll go and have it done. I remember getting the results. I was sitting with my daughter and um, when the um, genetic counselor came back and told me that I did carry the BRCA1 mutation, I think I was almost as shocked as when I found out that I got ovarian cancer. I was blown away and crying and upset. I think mostly because my daughter was sitting beside me and I thought, oh my God, like what, what have I passed down to my family? So it was really surprising, really shocking. I wish I had known more about it before. In my family, I have a son and a daughter. So we said, what should we do from here? And uh, we decided to go to genetic counseling as a whole family, and that's what we did. Some people decided to go ahead and have the testing, and also as a result of the testing, knowing yes or no, went ahead and made decisions according to that. Other people decided they didn't want to know, so they didn't get tested. After the other thing that happened after I found out that I carried the mutation is I decided to have prophylactic mastectomies. I didn't think much about it. It was a decision like I thought, oh no, I've already had ovarian cancer. I do not want to get breast cancer. So I did have, uh, in 2004, I had prophylactic mastectomies. My first clinical trial was actually 14 years after my initial diagnosis. That's how long it took to get into the clinical trial. I had already had a number of uh, recurrences and, and chemotherapies and surgeries and all of that. And um, my uh, doctor said to me, well, there's finally a clinical trial that you are eligible for. Are you interested? I got all the information from the clinical trial nurse. My husband and I discussed it. Um, I decided to go into the clinical trial. And um, I had some positive results from it. I did not get to a point where there was no evidence of disease, but there was definitely positive results. And I would recommend clinical trials, definitely, because um, there's never been a treatment found where there hasn't been a clinical trial first. So not they, obviously they don't all work, but some of them do. And in order to find new treatments, we need the clinical trials out there. And we need people to go into them. So of course you need to look at them. There are different phases of clinical trials. It depends on where you are in your disease. But don't look at them as the last, like the last thing that, this is my last chance. If this doesn't work, I'm gone. It's not like that. There are many clinical trials where um, they're offered to actually newly diagnosed patients now. And sometimes they're a combination of standard treatment plus another treatment. They're not always uh, just something brand new out there that might not work. Doctors never do that. They always give you they would never put you in a clinical trial. A lot of people ask me this too at meetings, but they put me in a clinical trial where I get nothing, just a placebo. I said, never, that never happens. You would always get some kind of treatment. And if after a little while, you're showing no response to that treatment, then they'll stop it and they'll put you on something else. But it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile to do it. When I found out that I was having a recurrence, um, I was more angry, like sad and angry, and I thought, that's it. Because from everything I read about ovarian cancer, knew about ovarian cancer, once you had a recurrence, it was all over but the shouting. So I thought that was it. I might have a year or so, but so I was very sad and angry, and um, it took a while to, to get over that. Since then, not Every time that I'm told that, okay, now I have to have treatment or now I have to have a surgery, it's just been, I won't say it's ever matter of fact because it's never matter of fact. And there are times where I have been upset and I go, oh God, here we go again. But I know I can get through it. 
gotten through it before. Just having the experience of doing it previously and know, yeah, it's crap, but I can come through the other end. It's like Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. So that's sort of my, my philosophy is that I just gotta keep going. When I was first diagnosed, I never ever expected to see grandchildren. Now I have three grandchildren and uh, we travel and we do things. And so I plan my life that way. I know that every few months, I have to probably have a CT scan and see what's going on and I might have to have treatment, I might get a break. So I just plan my life that way. It's like a job. It's my job to keep alive and that's what it is. And I get vacation off of that job and sometimes I don't. So it's not easy, but you can get through it.